Hi, this is Phil Shapiro. I've been reading a very interesting book, a new book, Bipolar, Not So Much, by Chris Aiken and James Felp. This is a book of great kindness and compassion and hope. I work at a public library, so I said to myself, I should read this book. The subtitle is Understanding Your Mood Swings and Depression. So it's kind of a guidebook, an owner's manual to your brain for people who are experiencing mental illness and for people who are family members or friends of people with mental illness, which is just about 100% of the population. Um, this book is maybe useful. Certainly very, very interesting. And I found it uh, worth my time. Here's the authors, Chris Aiken is the director of the Mood Treatment Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, instructor at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. He's active in medical research and published in the treatment and diagnosis of mood disorders. He began his career as a research assistant at the National Institutes of Mental Health and completed his medical training at Yale, Cornell, and Duke. Go Duke basketball. James Phelps has specialized in complex mood disorders for over 20 years, working with the Samaritan Mental Health in Corvallis, Oregon. He currently focuses on primary care psychiatric consultation and maintaining his nonprofit website, psycheducation.org. He's the author of A Spectrum Approach to Mood Disorders. This is from the back cover of the book. So it has some very favorable um, uh, testimonials, and I'm not going to read these aloud because um, this is being recorded at high resolution and you should be able to read these uh, on your own quite easily. They're very favorable. Res uh, here's some more. Here's some more. I won't rush through here, or you can stop the YouTube video to, to read this. Um, and Presumably, each of these people who are testimonial givers are well-known and respected in the field. So they themselves might be authors of books. I recommend you'd maybe look that up. It's good to be a little curious, isn't it? Good to be curious. So and this is the inside uh, jacket of the book. Depression confuses the mind, strips away hope, and causes people to blame themselves for an illness they never asked for. This book presents a revolutionary new understanding of the concept of depression and offers readers skills and strategies to manage it. Um, I'm not so sure if I like the word revolutionary new understanding, but it certainly was very interesting to me. Mood disorders are now seen to form a spectrum of problems from common depression on one hand to full bipolar disorder on the other. In between these extremes are multitudes of people who are in the middle of the road, middle of the mood spectrum, and this book is for them. The authors also empower readers to look beyond antidepressants. They walk readers through the new medications for the mood spectrum and offer a guide to non-medication treatments that anyone can use on their own from diet and lifestyle changes to natural supplements. The book also discusses other innovative technologies that can aid in recovery, including dawn simulators, mood apps, and blue light filters. This thoughtful and beneficial book will offer readers skills and strategies as well as hope in the face of debilitating mental challenges. Um, I found that m largely to be true. Um, and so this is from the actual book itself, I think the first chapter. This book comes on a wave, uh, this is a quote that I, I pulled. Uh, as you know, in my book reviews, I like to find interesting passages that I, I pull out something to give you a a flavor of the book. This book comes on a wave of increasing understanding of mood disorders and their treatment. Depression turns out to be caused by a very large number of genes that interact with environmental stress. These stressors lead to molecular changes inside the brain that are part of a normal process called neuroplasticity that gets carried too far in depression. The brain regions associated with depression have been so well identified that some research groups are now treating the illness with tiny amounts of electric current delivered precisely into the affected areas, a technique borrowed from the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Here's another quote that I um, wanted to share. An accurate diagnosis can help you find the right treatment. 
There are over 30 dep antidepressants in the United States, but there's a type of depression that won't respond to any of them. In fact, antidepressants can even make it worse. One out of every three people who ask, who seek help for depression have it, but it's so hard to recognize that it takes, on average, 10 years to accurately diagnose. So that little passage taught me so much. Um, we hope this book will help you figure out where you are on the mood spectrum, unipolar, bipolar, or somewhere in between. We'll walk you through the symptoms, give you some diagnostic tips, tests. By the way, Google has a test. Uh, you go to Google, they have, uh, you can type in, am I depressed? Uh, Google just announced that. This is September 2017, and Google announced that just recently. Type in, am I depressed in Google? Uh, and there is um, a diagnosis that a little, uh, I haven't gone through it yet, but I'm, I applaud Google. You probably should have done that 10 or 15 years ago, right? Uh, but I'm glad you did it now. Whatever words you end up with in your diagnosis, keep an open mind about it. Even the best physicians and medical tests can be wrong. And the spectrum view of mood is not without its flaws. So that's good. They, 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 they're admitting that their own perspective has its flaws sometimes. Depression is not a moral weakness. Like many health problems, it is strongly influenced by genes that people don't choose and stresses they have little control over. Stresses like starting school too early for teenagers. Unlike other health problems, depression tries to convince people that it's their own fault. The more they get convinced of that, the more depressed they become. It's a terrible loop, but that loop is not the person's fault either. A shift in brain chemistry can make such thoughts more likely. This is about hypomania, H-I-P-O-H-Y-P-O-M-A-N-I-A. It's very hard to recognize your own irritability during hypomania, in part because of the way hypomania affects the mind. Self-awareness falls or fails, so it's hard to see your own role in the problem. When Jeremiah talked to his therapist about the episode that lost him his girlfriend, he still thought the checkout clerk was the problem, not his hypomania. Hypomania also makes people single-minded and inflexible, leaving little room to compromise in an argument. Last, confidence soars, which means you know you're in the right no matter what. This is very interesting. The anxiety leads people to do all kinds of destructive things in a desperate attempt to find some relief. Drugs, alcohol, and binge eating are common. People often break things or hurt themselves, cutting their skin or banging their head. One woman would throw herself into the wall until the plaster cracked. All these destructive actions are really forms of self-medication, even if they don't involve drugs. For example, physical pain releases opioids in the brain that briefly calm the frayed nerves of a mixed state. So that is so, so interesting. If you see somebody involved in some self-destructive behavior, they're actually trying to soothe the calm in their mind, soothe the agitation, I guess, in their mind. And um, we have to try and find some compassion and uh, figure out what ways we can help them. Now, this is one of this is this is this is one of the best parts of the book. Safe relief from dangerous uses: take a very hot or very cold shower, squeeze an ice cube until it hurts, go for a vigorous run or swim, lift weights, go outside and pull weeds, tense your muscles for three seconds, then release one muscle at a time. Use body paint in place of self-cutting. Clean out something that needs heavy scrubbing. Put on loud music or soothing music, presumably not late at night and not in your apartment complex when you might be disturbing others. Pour, uh, maybe put on loud music, but use uh, headphones and be careful not to damage your ears. Pour school glue on your skin, let it dry and slowly peel it off. Bite a hot pepper, lemon peel, wasabi or fresh ginger. So, you know, when I was reading this, I work in a library. And uh, wouldn't it be interesting if libra libraries, public libraries or college libraries, if they had uh, a hot peppers or lemon peel or fresh ginger in the fridge of the library? And if somebody is experiencing uh, a psychotic episode or uh, some kind of uh, mental turmoil, 
uh, they can maybe ask the librarian, can you get me a hot pepper or something, or a fresh ginger. Now, presumably, that's not going to be coming as a request, as a common request by all members of the public, but um, perhaps, um, perhaps we got to try that, you know. Uh, it's, it's maybe a compassionate thing to do. Wasabi's, wasabi's strong. Oh, I'm a little scared. I mean, that stuff is strong. But anyway, um, we should maybe think about, you know, what, what role for librarians, um, to, uh, the library is a sanctuary and people who are experiencing mental illness need to be in a safe place. And so many librarians, um, want people with mental illness to feel welcomed and safe in a library setting as long as they're not disturbing others. Uh, and if they're experiencing turmoil, then uh, hot pepper, lemon peel, wasabi, or fresh ginger, uh, if that soothes the mind uh, in some way, then uh, perhaps it ought to be provided. Oh, and the diet part of this book was really, really interesting. Another example of the flavonoid effect comes from tea. Drinking three cups of tea lowers the risk of depression by 37%. Yes! And the benefit doubles when you go to six cups a day. Yes, I'm a big, I like tea. The benefit is strongest with black and green teas. Though not a flavonoid, coffee has similar benefits. People who drink coffee have lower rates of depression. But unlike with tea, that antidepressant effect does a reversal when you drink too much. The antidepressant effect of coffees levels out at one or two mugs per day. Beyond that, it seems to cause depression. So be real careful, I guess, with coffee and depression. Uh, but with tea, you can go a little bit, go a little bit overboard. Drinking any caffeine after 2 p.m. can worsen mood by disrupting sleep. But with tea, the flavonoid effect we're describing here holds up for decaffeinated options as well. So that is really, really interesting. And, um, maybe that's a good reason for public libraries to think about having um, uh, those communities who are, who are designing new public libraries, uh, it really makes sense for them to have a section of the library as a small cafe with tea and coffee. Um, or some, some libraries just allow tea and coffee, uh, to be drunk within the public reading area. So, but if it, if it, uh, if it lowers the risk of depression, uh, and, and if the library is a place for the mind, uh, we've got to try and figure out some ways of uh, providing that, um, that enhancement or uh, statistical benefit. Uh, if you find this book review interesting, you can see my other book reviews on my Google site, sites.google.com slash site, Phil Shapiro book reviews. And I will include that link in the description of this video. This video, for those who might be curious, uh, I made the screencast using a free software called Simple Screen Recorder. I have a Lenovo T420 ThinkPad laptop running Linux Mint that's also free. I record my audio on an Olympus digital audio recorder. And um, this Log I have a Logitech webcam, this webcam over here. And I'm using on my, this newer laptop, this is a Core i5 laptop that's, that I'm now using for my screencasts. I use GUVC View webcam software that's also free. Here's how you can contact me. There's my email, my Twitter, and my YouTube channel. To support my video book reviews, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel comment on the videos and rate the videos. Um, it's, it's useful if you don't like the video uh, to rate it negatively. Uh, I do appreciate that kind of feedback. Um, you can also support me with a small monthly contribution on Patreon. Uh, even if it's real small. Real small doesn't matter. It's a nice way of uh, kind of voting your vote of confidence. On Patreon, on patreon.com slash Phil Shapiro. And this is what that website ought to look like. Uh, I just recently set it up so I don't have all that many patrons. Um, but I love the whole idea of Patreon. I support a bunch of other people on Patreon. And um, 
uh, I have to thank Sarah Sharp. She's the person who, uh, open source guru and, uh, highly respected community leader in open source, Sarah Sharp. Uh, she got me interested in Patreon as just a way of, uh, you don't have to be a performing musician. A lot of Patreon people were performing musicians. Uh, I'm not a performing musician as much as I'm like a community builder. And so uh, that's a good enough reason for people to support me. This is Phil Shapiro. I hope you found this helpful or interesting or both. See you next time.